uh, I try and look at this thing uh, two ways, this thing, whatever the thing is that we're trying to, to move around. And um, look at it, first of all, historically and at a national policy level to see what sense it makes, if at any, any at all. And then try and move into a whole other domain, which is a domain that I think I would frame as simply authentic organizational change. Uh, because in some senses in the country, the two are completely at odds. One comes out of a political vortex driven by all sorts of different actors, and it kind of cascades on the practice. And the practice has to pick it up state by state, local by local, school by school, and figure out what the hell they have to comply to, what's of value, and try and cherry pick it, and so forth, stay in compliance, try and make some of it useful, and so forth. That's, that's actually the way we do educational policy, sad to say. All right? and, and so I, in my mind, it seems it's always important in rooms like this um, to somehow say, how did this occur? Let's just look briefly back. Uh, who was driving it and for what reasons? What's not, not even there logically? And then I try and move to a, a, a kind of a frame that says, if you were actually doing this in an authentic and healthy way as an organizational change attempt with a union and a management that were actually trying to produce good cars together, what would you actually do to improve and so forth? And it, it, it seems to me, at least in that dialogue, you get, you get the reality here, and then you at least get some pull about kind of the ought and the, and, the, and the science of organizational change, because in some senses that's what you're actually doing any given day. You're trying to weave the compliance reign, if you will, uh, into something that makes some sense for your folks. And then, of course, you're always trying to do that. I mean, I say this after 40 years, 20 of which was in the private sector. If we actually thought this was important, at Ford or Boeing or John Deere or Goodyear, uh, where I spent half my life, you'd actually put enormous resources in it for some period of time. You'd gather everything, you'd align it, and you'd say, OK, here we go. One time only, we're going to retrain everybody all the way down, and we're going to move to this. We don't do any of that. All right? So we have to do it the way we can do it. All right? So what I wanted to do is to, to talk with you in some senses about the, in the first 10 or 15 minutes about what all of us have experienced and what we have to do as we move across the country. We're in Florida next week, as you know. We're in Seattle the next week. And it, it, it's always the same issues. What are we going to talk about in terms of the core curriculum? All right. And then we move to evaluation. All right. And then we move back and forth around what do we know about park and smart balance and kind of the ability to talk about, think about, and measure student growth at some level and so forth. And you say, if you were really doing this in, in some thoughtful, cognitively consistent way, you would in some senses, first of all, frame it just the way you ought to frame it in, in order to build deep kind of early embrace. So what you would have done six or seven years ago is you would have gone to the two organized labor group and the management groups at the national and state level, and you would have said, we think we would like to, and you would start the invitation. And the invitation would have to have been authentic and say, let's make the journey together. All right? the, the way Ford would walk across the street to the UAW and say, we're in trouble. We've got to change the quality piece. Will you come with us? And Don Eflin says, yes. If it means that I will save jobs, da 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 da, protect my people and so forth, I'll build it into contracts in 79, we'll do it together. That's not what happens here. So the first piece I want to do is just talk about the way this thing got framed, because it will haunt us, all right, and uh, in, in many ways, it will continue to haunt us a bit. This thing actually gets framed not so much as a collaborative effort at all, as you all remember, is three things happen almost simultaneously about six to seven years ago. We get a kind of a popular piece that actually is true, in which, and, and Tim Daly and some other folks do it, but it's a popular piece that basically says there's no evaluation of education, bottom line, you know, and everybody reads it. So the first, and, and it's popularized in USA, everybody's got it front page. So the first piece of data is there's no evaluation of teachers anywhere in the country, and they say so, da 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 
Right on top of that comes the first kind of cascade of international comparative data that says the US in whatever you pick your choose. It, we're 15th to 23rd, all right? That's a public piece of data. Nobody knows quite what PISA is and so forth, but nobody cares. Well, the message, the second message is, this thing isn't very good and is in some senses getting worse. The work these folks do that don't, that don't get any evaluation. And the third piece, I'm simply picking up the national frame as it hits us. And the third piece, of course, is that that actually less than 1% are dismissed, pa 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 all right, and so forth. So all of a sudden, the first frame is really bad quality, no evaluation, and the unions protecting, in general, everybody, and so forth. So there's no accountability. That's the first frame around saying, let's do a national evaluation process. Right. And if you will, the, the other piece, and I think we have to do this just in the, in the, in the kind of the, the interest of openness. Our, if you will, our sponsor in the sense that at least one of our funders is a major contributor early on probably uh, to that frame. Gates in some senses helps, um, and, and think about this, this is a country in which there is a private sector piece of money with such power that it's spending two and three times more than the comparable national group that sets policy, setting policy. So if you, you know, uh, you have to say you almost at that moment have two departments of education setting the frame and the question. That's very, very important to, I think, look back because we will continue to try and we need, you know, the executive committee of the AFT in this room with good faith. It's really important that Fran's here. It's really important the NEA is here. How they stayed in the room, I'm not being their apologist at all, but how you stay in the room when it gets framed that way coming at you uh, as you're the protector of bad quality, you don't care about the evaluation and so forth, it's tough then to say to the UAW of your Ford, oh, by the way, I just blamed you for all the shit we've been making. Now, will you come on in? All right? And will you help us make a better car? And they say, let me think about that. All right? I might come, but I might not, all right? Since you just threw me under the bus. Right? And I, I, it's, you know, we have to go back, and this is only our brief history. This is six or seven years ago, at least in the way this thing frames. Then, in terms of logic, we say, well, how would you, in some senses, evaluate these folks if you were actually going to? Because, by God, we're going to, all right? And then, you get this really interesting piece, some of which is extremely positive, which is you say, well, does anybody know what good teaching looks like? Now think about that. That's our fault in the sense that up until, up until Charlotte surfaces, and, and you know, we got two other people that we think are really good research, but in general, in this room 10 years ago, if I'd said, do we share any kind of a rubric we, we think describes more or less good teaching? The answer would have said, I don't know, I think there's a woman out there, Princeton, half crazy, all right, and she's been doing some of this, but I don't know, all right? We did not have a common language to talk about our profession and its quality. We did not have one. That's that's our fault, right? I mean, the reason somebody can walk in and say, here's what it's going to be is because we don't have one as a profession to say, oh no, this is good quality. We stand for it. We train it. We have common language. The evaluators and the people who enter the profession all understand the common language. We had none of that 10 years ago. I, I, so the third piece, of course, is then anybody says, the, the next question, of course, it's not a kind of a logic piece, all right, but somebody then says, do we have any measures, all right, do we have any measures at all? And of course, we've got a 2001-2 piece of federal legislation, somewhat bizarre, that says, no child left behind, you're going to have some measurement, I don't care what it is, but you have to set the bar, you've got two years to do it, and then that lovely kind of corporate ease that gets put in there, and I, I still haven't figured out who put it in, that says there's going to be automatic improvement at 4% a year until you reach the magic year of 2014, in which all children will be at perfect, all right? In terms of, all right. And in 2001-2, I think we all said, ah, 2014. I bring it on, all right? So at any rate, it gets framed then that we need some sort of measurement, all right? Well, if you look at where we were, think where we were. I mean, again, it's, it's a reflection on us. 
did we in some senses have, even in maybe five states had some sort of measure that you might have stood behind, but in general it's what I decided in my class was what my goals were. Maybe I talked with three other people if they were teaching it, and we decided to some end of year or end of course and we would have a common test, but that was rare. In general, I set the goal, I measured it, and I told you I got her over the bar. I got them all over. All right, some of them got a D, some of them got a C, but we, we moved, all right, and so forth. That, and, and you multiply that by tens of thousands of classrooms. We're measuring at classrooms, some with absolute integrity, really good professionals, pushing themselves and their children, and some not. We didn't know where we were. So we had no rubric, we had no measurements that we trusted, all right, and we had no, in some senses, collaborative approach or strategy to this thing called evaluation. So when you get jumped in the alley, you should know why you walked in there, all right? And you should know why, in some senses, four guys surprised you, all right? So at least looking back, you should know that, all right? And then, of course, the bizarre piece is that as we make national policy, the feds can't make national policy. It's against the Constitution. It's against the, the rules of the land. So in the middle of this, but after the fact of evaluation and the measurement, somebody comes in and says, of, of the most surprising kind, 45 groups that never do anything together called the states of the United States. All right? We had to force them at gunpoint at the beginning to say they would allow carriages to cross their, uh, in terms of commerce, across their borders. All right? uh, and to say that they would somehow put up some money for a common army if they had to against vicious Canada and so forth. Right. <laughs> Bottom line, they don't cooperate on anything. All right? And they appear onto this scene five, six years ago and say, as you do the evaluation and as you do the measurement, we are going to move the marker significantly higher. Based on this international data we got, we're all going to move to a fairly rigorous piece here. Now, you wouldn't have done it at least in that order. You would have done the deep invitation of the folks who represent the professionals and the administration. You would have brought the school boards along and so forth. And then you say, OK, now how would we do this? And then you'd say, well, do we need to move the bar? Do we need common kind of language and rubrics around the evaluation? Do we need to then begin to say, how will we measure this? And this being student growth. And then you would, over a period of time, as you put resources into it and trained it up, you would have said, can I use, is it valid to use this measurement for student growth to also basically measure uh, the input of an adult teacher with respect to that? And you say, well, that's a much bigger question. You may need a different tool. Let's, let's begin to do the research on that. That's not exactly the way this thing came at us. So all I'm really saying is, as you look at it in 2014, all right, it, it came in a jumble. It came in a jumble because we basically have a policy process that is a bit of a jumble. In some sense, the states here, the federal government that can and cannot say certain kinds of things. Uh, and then this amazing other piece, uh, because of the way we were organized and kind of formed up in 1880, to, to 1910, which is to say, and oh, by the way, at least 25 of the constitutions of the states say that nobody can do anything at any level until you reach a local community. And local control makes most of these decisions you're talking around, curriculum, evaluation, and so forth. So I'm simply trying to add to the puzzle that says, and by the way, if you walk in Colorado, they're saying the constitution says local control. I don't even want to hear from the state. All right. So all of a sudden, this thing is up for grabs at every possible level, and yet there's a kind of a marching to it, competitive grants for the first time, and so forth. So I simply want to say that the first thing you have to sort out, now go to my second piece, which is to say, if I were doing this in a deep, organic way that gave me a chance to move a very big, complex organization doing very complex work, all right, spread from from Florida to, to, uh, to Oregon and Washington, I would probably have done it in another sequence more slowly with better resources in a logical fashion. I think everybody in the room agrees with that. Right? 
let me just, I'm, I'm trying to layer this. Then you get to this moment that, again, you would not have imagined. It's really interesting because we've got Joe back, if you will, at CEC, but he basically spent five years watching the voices on this and so forth, and in some senses keeps helping us sort it out. But notice the last piece. The last piece is, and I happen to think very highly of the Secretary of Education, but if you look, he's pretty passionate about his agenda, all right? And so two years ago, here's the last piece. The last piece is, and you wouldn't have imagined this, the federal government process of making legislation is basically broken beyond belief for the last 10 years, particularly in education. Senator Kennedy, who's driven it for many, many years and was behind the No Child Left Behind, is gone and so forth. And long story short, we have not had a piece of legislation in ESEA, all right? that empowers and basically informs the, the country and its policies. We haven't had a piece of legislation in 10 years. We all know that, all right? So he says, at the edge of his authority, if not way over it, all right? He says, since this is broken, all right? I now have the ability to grant you a waiver to that piece of legislation in 2001 that said you were supposed to be in 2014 at 100%. I will let you off the hook. I will give you a waiver if you do evaluation at a certain kind of way with student data as a certain percentage. And then he negotiates, as he needs to, with each state around that waiver. Now, you can't make up a story like that. <laughs> no, I mean, you can't. You can't make up a story in, in which it kind of comes at us this way, and then at the last minute, it's a gunfight or a poker game. All right, with all good intent, and everybody's saying, well, God, I got to do something at the table here. You know, Illinois, just after four years of the stare down with the last card, you know, gets permission and so forth. California basically says, I don't think so. <laughs> what are you going to do? All right, and so, so the, the, the card game is fascinating itself, all right, across the country, all right? And the last piece. Um, because I didn't, I avoided it, and I deliberately avoided it, and I shouldn't, so I, I always make myself go back. I talked to you about the eight sponsoring organizations that we work for collaboratively around, uh, around the Common Core and so forth. Obviously, there's a group that's not in there. There's a group that's not mentioned at the table sitting up there in St. Louis a month ago saying, we are going to basically work together to do this nationally and so forth and so on. And that, by the way, is the group, of, uh, the group that trains everybody who enters the profession. This would be as if, I think, as if every medical professional in the country, and every hospital, every, every place that we practice, all right, was moving like this, but the med schools are basically saying, let's talk again about the use of leeches. <laughs> now, I'm exaggerating, obviously, all right? But you've got to ask yourself the question, where the hell are the teacher training organizations that control the flow all right, especially since we are now, what, average age of a teacher in the country at 1.3 years or something? I mean, the flow here is enormous. The turnover is enormous, all right? All right? And if they're not with us on all of the pieces that we're trying to move here, and obviously some of them are and are spectacular, but in general, they are not at the table. Secretary Duncan has, has taken them on, I think, every which way he knows how. It's a tough, tough journey. That's, you know, th that's a puzzle that you'd say, oh, I've got a strategy. We got a, some, a, some pieces of the strategy. We got it kind of ass backwards. And there's a couple of people who aren't with us yet. But other than that, we got it lined up. All right. So this thing, in some senses, doesn't come to us powerful, consistent, cohesive, aligned, and resourced. We all know that. All right? What you do, I think, and in, in this room, our job is to say, yeah, well, who's doing it anyway? And who's doing it well? And how can we get on with it? And how can we learn from one another? That's the room, all right? So um, that is a background. I thought I might then, as we move into this really good discussions, I mean, the neat thing about 
the Gates money is we can say, who's the best in the country, Montgomery County, on what? let's go get them, bring them in, and so forth. We've got some really good case studies this morning around who's doing what with respect to these issues. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important to, to, uh, to listen and to kind of push this. <clears throat> the way to listen to these case studies is in some sense is not as obviously a bunch of what's that you ought to go do, but to, to, to a checklist against where you are, what processes you're using, and so forth. All right. Uh, the first case study yesterday, there, there's always an ongoing dialogue around what gets done, why you do it, but the real learning is around how. And sometimes there's a what here that you've forgotten and they haven't and vice versa, or you've got and they don't, but there's a whole lot of learning around the processes of change. And so you want to ask questions at the what, the how, and in some senses not repeat the why about caring for children with each other anymore, because we got it. I mean, we, we, we haven't given 40 years of our life because we're not clear on the why. All right. So, Last, the last kind of frame that I want to use is to, in some senses, look at this, look at what happens to us in terms of our speed and timing. I think that's the main re result. It isn't that we're dumb, and it isn't that we don't care. It's that, in some senses, we have to do all of the work, and then we have to do this reform work, and that, that affects our quality. So here's one man's opinion around what we still should be doing if we could. All right. When we walked up to this thing 10 years ago, all right, here, here was what the, the evaluation piece looked like, the professional dialogue. There was input into, in some senses, a teacher. And that's all we used, in the sense that when we talked about quality, we talked about anything like, we basically said, does she have a degree? Did she do another degree? How long has she done the work? And uh, has she done other kinds of training and so forth? All input, none of which we had any research said that it had any difference, made any difference in whether she was effective or not. All right? It's all input, and that's why, in some senses, it, didn't, it doesn't carry much weight. All right? Now, we still ought to re be thinking about that, because there's some ways of thinking about this. But here's what happened in terms of the evaluation. Without much debate, we basically said, that's polluted. No research base. We're not going to talk about it anymore. Yeah, you maybe have to have a license out of a teacher training group, but you know, we say that just the way I just said it. All right? And we said, forget all that. We're moving to pure output. And you say, but I don't know how to measure output. And somebody says, too bad, measure it. All right. We don't know how to measure output. We do not. This thing is too complex. We can. We can sure as hell get better than we've been. And we sure can get better than having never measured it except by classroom. We can better. But this thing went almost overnight to say, get a test in Tennessee. All right. And so forth and so on. I think the park and the smarter balance movement is an enormous improvement. Improvement, all right? Enormous improvement, but we need some time, and we certainly shouldn't confuse, all right? The language around no, uh, student movement and growth and teacher effectiveness with respect to it. There's some relationship, obviously, and it's pretty profound, but we need to know what it is. So all of a sudden, we moved here, my argument is simply into a certain kind of testing arena based on, if you will, some set of scores of something children can do in math and reading, something like that, all right? Real fast. And we basically said, there it is. That's the evaluation process. And we added a really nice piece, all right? Which is to say, at least let's find some common language. And we had a nice piece of research kind of waiting for us out of Charlotte and a couple other places. We pieced it together. And at least over the last eight years, you'd have to say in the country, we now have a common way all right, to talk about when we look at film, whatever. When we see somebody do this work, we can look at 22 or eight or four domains. We've got some language in which that teacher and evaluator and a bunch of other teachers, when we start to grade it, score it, we've all been through that in the rubric, we can come pretty close to basically agreeing on this. So this is, in some senses, a great gift. Great gift. This is jumped way too fast. And this, in some senses, shouldn't be walked away from quite as quickly as we did it. 
But my point is that's how fast it happened without much debate at all. As a matter of fact, kind of terrain and, and, and so forth. Now the second piece, I'm moving to the why now for just a moment. We've done this in this room, but I want to go back and get it because I want to show you how, how, how poorly designed this is in many ways. You'd have to say, oh, I understand that. That's teaching. And then I would ask you the why question, which is say, why are you teaching these children for 10, 11, 12 years? What are you doing there? What are you trying to do? And you'd say then, oh, I'm trying to do something around academic growth and development. And it looks like I need some, some higher rigor because the data's coming in that, and so forth and so on. I say, fine, got it. And you'd say, what else are you trying to do? You'd say, well, I'm trying to do something around a personal growth of a child. Always have been. All right? And it's different for kindergartners than it is for seniors in high school, but I'm always working it, and I'm always working it in the back of my head every day in some dance with 24 other uh, children. I mean, it's Seymour Saracen's beautiful books on the dance of teaching as opposed to anything else. All right? And that takes enormous skill, and that's the pedagogical piece of engaging them in content here and so forth and so on. It's the fun that keeps you alive for 30 and 40 years in this thing, all right? Over here is this wonderful dream we had that nobody, almost nobody else in the, in the world had, is that we're also going to use education for everyone as a social, a powerful equity issue. That is, that nobody in France cares whether the bottom third, all right, is going to the, to the polytechnique. Nobody cares. That's not what they're trying to do. As a matter of fact, in Germany, France, and Great Britain, they're trying to sort so they get the top 10% to go to that, and so forth and so on. We're trying to do something else with public education at the same time that we're educating in an academic sense. We're trying to make the, level, the field level. All right. As a matter of fact, almost everybody else in the world doesn't pay any attention to this. This really is important. It's powerful, it's ethical, but it confuses the hell out of what you're trying to do here on scores. And you better be able to talk about it and, and work on it together and so forth. And the last piece that you can't talk about anymore in this country, but that we actually founded the institution to do, was to teach children how to be citizens in a democracy. That's off the table now, all right? If you get too close to that, it's a value issue, and, and you've got to be really skilled in social sciences in the high school to slip that stuff in. All right. Good value debate with respect with one another about the core of the country and what we believe in. All right. In general, both the right and the left don't want you anywhere near that, because right. they don't trust that in some senses their values are going to be the public education professionals push on that. And, you know, and we, we're not trying to sell values here. We're trying to sell the ability to take responsibility over against a set of values in a democracy and what that means. You know. And you teach that at 10, 12, 15, 18. So, so in here, it used to be, and I'll, so I'll put it in quotes, citizenship. And I say that because in some senses, those Irishmen and Italians and so forth in Massachusetts all right, in the 18th century didn't know what that meant, and we had to teach them. All right, and we were also teaching them to be good little factory workers and so forth, and we can unpack that some other day. So um, I want you to look at this now, and this will be the frame for the day in, in the sense of in the back of your head. What actually happened was that because we did this scoring real fast, without any debate, we actually didn't have any discussion around the effect anywhere around this thing, and we defined academic growth as two areas in the narrowest possible fashion. Literacy and mathematical kind of computational skills in a very narrow sense as the single definition of what the hell we were trying to do for 12 years. It becomes this, and this gets hooked here, and it's overnight, we don't do this very well, but this is the wrong debate anyway. You can't stop teaching history, geography, music, art, and so forth in the name of competition and in some senses give up the dream. You can, <laughs> but you probably shouldn't. And so the question I'm trying to kind of pull down here is, this thing still ought to be open for debate. Even as we get jammed 
around the scores and the evaluation, we ought to have some other way to keep this open, to certainly put these things back on the table in some sort of dialogue with our communities around how we might measure these things as well, talk about these things as well, give ourselves report cards on this as opposed to the newspaper giving this as our report. That's not your report. You know, this should be, but we lose our language and we lose our voice around what we believe in, what we think we're doing, and how to speak about it. So I would go back up here and say two or three thoughts kind of to expand this. First of all, I think Charlotte and any other language we're using around the process, it's really important in some senses to first of all say, and, and she's fun around this as well, which is to say, this gives you enormous ability to talk to peers and to each other and to evaluate, all right? But in some senses, you, the, can you move from formative to summative, and how do you do that with the same language? Uh, can you do it without somebody beginning to distrust it and so forth? What's our, what's our preparation around this? What's our ownership of it? A, a, and so forth. And I want to stop there for just a minute and say, I think in some senses we haven't opened this up the way we probably should. And uh, you know, as we move around the country, we look at some very different ways to look at both the output and the process. All right? For instance, I think Hillsborough has probably got the, uh, a huge federation uh, 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 district in, in, in Florida. And I would simply say there are places out there that are playing with this in ways that are, I think, just rather remarkable. All right? The Hillsborough model is, in some senses, 100 full-time teaching staff out of the classroom doing all of the evaluation for all the rest of the teachers. And you say, how do you do in that? It's crossed every possible line, including a labor management legal line, and so forth. But it turns out that the 100 teachers are much more informed and have more time to do it at a high quality level than any of the principals who are running frantically up and down now evaluating everybody in quotes and so forth. And the way they do that is just really neat, I think. I love it because it's tricky and you can't catch them. All right? <laughs> and what they do is they take Charlotte's four domains and they say to the teacher leadership, given the feedback, you have responsibility for working with all the teachers every three years, all teachers, every three years, good, deep feedback from other teachers. You have responsibility for working the first three domains. All right. Preparation, engagement of children, you got it, all right? And the fourth domain, contribution to the school, the principal evaluates, and since she is part of the evaluation, she signs the evaluation. Now that's really good stuff. In the sense that you slip the noose of a really old piece of, of railroad legislation in 1933 that says nobody who does this can touch this and so forth. It's a false demarcation. You know, can you imagine doctors allowing hospital administrators to evaluate, evaluate their medical practice? Now I know this is a little bit different, but we shouldn't give, there's nothing wrong with professionals giving professionals feedback. And in, in clearly, if you're doing the formative side of it, that's all that should be happening, all right? And we're, I think, all moving on that on PLCs and so forth. The question I want to call is, have we too fast closed the summative question by saying, oh, no, the law says only those folks? I would urge us to say, I wonder if there are some nice tricks, all right, in which we can, in some senses, experiment with each other surely on the formative piece around really good, strong feedback. I know I'm pushing a button there. I'd love to push it. All right. All right. The second piece is in some senses to say, well, not only, so I'm trying to beg the question of who does this work? All right. Who should be doing this work? The second piece is in some senses all the stuff that we've all talked about. All right, and here's an example. Caltern, the groups in, in California are beginning to look at this. And the reason is, as I described yesterday, they've got some time, some resources, and they don't have the thundering herd of testing right, right behind them, all right? So they're basically saying, well, can't you describe other ways qualitatively 
of what it is we're doing, even in terms of academic growth, so that the qualitative measures that we used were much better and sounder than a short-term three-hour test around a quantitative piece. We do the quantitative piece because that's all we can figure out how to do with 20 million children. All right, let's be, let's be straight. We wouldn't just do that if we were if in, our, in our own classroom. All right. so, so the point is, should we give up on all qualitative descriptors of teaching that come not only out of the process, but move into our ability to basically measure qualitative issues? Let me give you an example out of the medical field again. All right. um, heart doctors in general, 10 years ago, all right. if you're a cardiologist, if you look at the quantitative data they've got around whether you're a possible uh, uh, future victim of, of failure of some kind or another, you know, they, what can they do? They can, bottom line, their best quantitative data is a good stress test and measurement of what happens on the way up and on the way down. That bottom line, that's their, their best diagnostic. Right? About 10 years ago, a bunch of cardiologists in New York and a couple of other places, but the article comes out of there, basically say that's real late. And that's, not, that's some good data, but it's not perfect. And they said, what other data, unobtrusive measures, qualitative measures, do we believe, just as professionals, do we believe basically tells us something predictive? And so they get together, believe it or not, you know, like 10 questions that they ask, you know, 55-year-old males who think they're invulnerable and so forth. And they say, and they ask you questions that are real simple, like, do you take responsibility for your health? Do you think what you do in terms of eating and exercise have anything to do with your future life and so forth? And based on kind of how they respond to that, do you take, do you do this and this? They're qualitative measures of attitudes of a person about their own health. Turns out that that is as good a predictor of future heart failure as the quantitative score diagnostics they have. And so almost every cardiologist in the country now is trained on the use of this scale. Why wouldn't we do qualitative measures around children and so forth around some of these other issues in terms of that? Why would we at least give up? Why would we go quantitatively to here when nobody in this room, nobody in this room, believes this measures what it is we do completely, even close? And where did we have that dialogue, you know, uh, so forth? And the last piece uh, in terms of uh, output, and I'm just saying this not because these are the what's. I'm just simply saying there are places out there at the edges that ought to give us pause. The last piece is Ferguson's work on student survey data, which is to say, you know, he goes in, he asks them, who are the good teachers? And give me descriptors of the good teachers. And they describe, he gives them, what, 27 pieces they can choose. The four they choose would, would blow you away, which is to say, if you haven't seen the tripod project out of Harvard and Ferguson's data, it's remarkable. The first indicator, the highest indicator of these tough kids, all right, these are good inner city kids, all right, basically is the teacher was rigorous and demanding. Number two, we didn't waste time. Number three, she gave me some support and so forth and so on. A really good definition of a teacher, high, hard, and deeply supportive, all right? So we could crank in survey literature here, survey data. Turns out that that's as good a predictor as anything, including really good process observation using Charlotte or anybody else. Right. So my thrust is simply, I know how it's come at us. I know what it is we're sorting out in the room, and I think everybody's filled with admiration for each other around how well we're doing, all right? And you certainly want to do it collaboratively. But I think you ought to keep it open as long as you can. And you ought to let schools talk and help you say, well, there's some qualitative things we're trying to do here, too. So that they begin to, and see, I think this leaves open the idea that says, if I've got 15 schools and they're all somewhat unique and they think they're doing something special with their kids, why wouldn't they include that in their report card and some way to measure that, to do interviews and so forth. So uh, as we move into the evaluation piece and how we've built it and how we've, in some senses, uh, come to terms with the way this thing came at us, all right, and we're, uh, we're a year or two away from D-Day on it. 
Uh, and we take into account all the things that I said yesterday around these court cases and how this is going to get mitigated is a good guess. You've got to keep, stay open on that. This thing's going to still sort itself out. All right? But bottom line, I think the real question, I think, is what do professionals engage deeply? What would you do if you actually didn't have this thing coming at you like a hammer? How would you begin to describe good teaching, good results, input, output, and process observations, such that it doesn't get frozen too fast all right, with imposed language, so that you end up saying, how do we implement, how do we implement, as opposed to saying, what do we do here around these questions for our children and our teachers, our parents? 